So now going back into the five Bs, we've handled the bleeds. Now we need to talk about being able to handle breaks and sprains. Uh, and again, a lot of times the, the bleed is a life threat. It's an immediate life threat, uh, something you need to handle quickly. Uh, a break and a sprain, you know, granted there's some danger because you have broken bone ends that are sharp and they're running very close to vessels. If you don't immobilize that and stabilize that, then what can happen is a compound fracture where you actually puncture through the skin. Now you have an open wound uh, as well as a break and you have to handle the bleed before you handle the actual fracture itself. Uh, or you had a simple fracture which is closed uh, with no damage to the skin, no puncturing through, but you rupture a vessel and have a lot of internal bleeding, bleeding that you need to take care of. Uh, so you need to be able to splint those type of injuries. So aside from you know, preventing further injury, what you're trying to do is regain mobility because that may be the only reason you're forced to spend the night out in the wilderness exposed to the elements unprepared is you cannot physically walk out because you've got a debilitating injury. So that's what the goal of this kit is is to be able to handle that and get yourself back uh, and kind of self-rescue, if you will, uh, get yourself back to civilization, go on and get uh, higher medical care. So with that, for a simple breaks and sprains kit, I recommend carrying at least one 36 inch SAM splint. Uh, pretty much everything that you need to do can be do with, done with one, with the exception of two being better. So if you can carry two 36 inch, then carry it. They pack extremely small, they're very flat, and they fit everything well. You can just slide this down pretty much any kit you have. Uh, and a lot of things can be improvised, but this is one of the things that are go is going to save you a lot of time. And they're very effective splints to use in the field. So personally, I carry two 36 inch, one 18 inch, and one 9 inch. A lot of these smaller ones are good for upper extremity injuries, like to the hand and to the wrist, but they're also great for kids, which I have four of. So. I carry smaller ones uh, as well, uh, as well as I also have students that are different sizes. So I'm at a minimum, one of these, I recommend two of these 36 inches uh, for everyone's kit. And if you've got small ones, if you've got little ones, then an 18 inch and a nine inch, it'll all pack together nice and flat. And you can pretty much handle anything you need to handle in the wilderness as far as breaks and sprains with that assortment of splints. The only thing I would add to that, which is not necessarily a debilitating injury, but it is an injury that can be painful. Uh, it could mean the difference between being able to carry your equipment out or not, uh, is these small little finger splints. Um, they don't weigh enough or take up enough room for me to justify not taking them. So those same finger splints is kind of what I recommend. So that assortment of sizes will handle everything that you're going to run into as far as breaks and sprains. Two 36 inch, an 18 inch, a 9 inch, and one to three finger splints. Uh, so that's kind of what you're using for splinting material. A kind of a multifunctional item that you can also use for those smaller splints are these tongue depressors. Uh, they're great for finger splints, they're great for a lot of other things uh, as well. So really thin pack nicely, they're lightweight, another good addition to that. But anyway, you have things to splint with and then things to secure those splints in place. I recommend that you use elastic bandages. Uh, I've got typically two six inch and two three inch. I tend to use these more often than not on injuries to the lower extremity. Uh, and I tend to use these smaller ones on injuries to the upper extremity. Uh, it's just the way it ends up working out. And, and two of each size has been all I've ever needed uh, in these kits. So that's what I recommend. And these can also be used as pressure bandages to kind of supplement or in place of these Israeli dressings or emergency trauma dressings, these can be used to actually apply pressure dressings as well. So those are multifunctional. Good piece of kit to have in your gear. And so in addition to having these elastic bandages that you can use for securing, you can also secure it with tape. Uh, and this goes back to kind of that universal thing that applies to a lot of different kits. But as far as breaks and sprains go, you know, taping those splints on, forming certain types of splints, which we'll get into, uh, it's a good idea to have this tape, as well as something like a usable anchor, uh, anchor injury, your injury on your anchor, and you can't put it out. For a usable ankle injury, you could do something as simple as taping this uh, or taping that ankle and still make your way out uh, successfully. So um, 
Tape is definitely a great thing to have, uh, kind of as part of your brakes and sprains kit. And then 3M makes this product called Coban, uh, which is basically a self-adhering wrap, uh, both this is called Coflex, so it must be a different brand. They're all trademarked. But this is basically a self-adhering wrap that also has some elasticity in it. So this works well, especially if you buddy tab it beforehand. But it's kind of a combination between the tape and your elastic bandages. So you could use those for those applications as well. So this is a good thing to have in your kit uh, as far as the brakes and sprains go. Once you have your splitting material and something to secure that with, another great thing to secure splitting material with, and as well as use for bandaging in your bleeding kit, as well as a lot of other applications for survival and emergency situations, are cotton cravats, uh, also known in the civilian market as triangular bandages. Uh, but this is just a triangular piece of cotton. Uh, I like the military cravats. These particular ones are from North American Rescue. Rescue. North American Rescue, uh, it's just a triangular bandage and you use those for sling and swath techniques as well as securing splints. And of course, cotton has a lot of other applications. Uh, but five of those will do any technique that I'm gonna show you in this video series. Uh, so they're very compact and lightweight. These have all been folded out, but they typically come in a package and they're about this size. So five cravats I add to my brakes and sprains kit because that handles a lot of things that we need to be able to handle in a remote wilderness setting. So after you know bleeding being the most life-threatening and then brakes and sprains, the loss of mobility and the potential for furthering or making that injury more severe is next. Then after that, probably the most severe thing that you're gonna run into in the wilderness is a burn. Uh, and typically we're not dealing with large surface area burns, we're dealing with small surface area burns, right? It's, it's being scalded from dropping boiling water on yourself, reaching into the campfire and grabbing a hot metal container when you were boiling your water to disinfect it. Uh, a small surface area burn is typically what we're running into. Maybe you burnt yourself a little bit on the coals of the fire or the flame from your campfire. That's typically what we're running into, uh, but you need to be able to handle small surface area burns and large surface area burns. And we'll talk about that when we get into uh, burns. But as far as having things in your kit, the, basically the, the, the short version of that is you have a wet dressing and you have dry dressings. One is more appropriate for different things. Uh, or one is more appropriate than the other for certain uh, injuries. Like a small surface area burn, you're gonna use a wet dressing on. Uh, and larger surface area, you're gonna use dry dressings on. So I recommend, again, from North American Rescue, uh, Burn Tech is basically a wet gel. It's a wet dressing for burns. Uh, at least one of those, and this is a four inch by four inch. They make them in all different sizes, uh, but most of the stuff that you're gonna be handling, this represents probably a 1% surface area burn, which is basically the palm of that person's hand. Uh, and that's typically what you're gonna run into in a wilderness setting, aside from something like uh, an electrical burn being struck by lightning, which is not very common at all, uh, or being stuck in a forest fire. In that case, that's, that's not something that, that we usually run into. So being able to handle the smaller burns is what we're going for. Then basically for the dry, larger surface area, uh, we have, again, from North American Rescue, these are dry, sterile burn dressings, which are essentially cravats, but these are actually sterile, right? These are clean, but these are sterile. Uh, burns, you'll learn later, are highly susceptible to infection, uh, so keeping them as clean as possible is something that we want to do. Uh, and then, of course, part of that kit, again, is that irrigation syringe uh, to keep those clean and cool them off uh, before you dress them up. Uh, so that is kind of what's in my burns kit. But as far as Wrapping those up and giving some additional protection, I've got some additional compressed gauze uh, in there. You could use the same thing. The chance of you having you know, a bleed and a burn at the same time may be a little more slim, so maybe you're only carrying one or two of these uh, and you can get away with that. Uh, I carry a couple of extras in my kit. That is for burns. And then as far as a blister kit, for your blisters, Really, it comes down to prevention. You know, your, your boot choice or your footwear choice, having well broken in boots, uh, taking care of hot spots whenever you feel them coming on is something you wanna do. But there are some things that you can carry uh, to make your life easier. And 
Blisters are painful, but they're not necessarily debilitating. They're not necessarily a loss of mobility all the time, but they can make your progress out very slow, especially if you took something like a snowmobile 50 miles out into the wilderness and it broke down and ran out of gas and you're making your way out. Um, you may have the rest of your life to get back out of the wilderness. Um, so anything that slows you down and becomes a nuisance is something you need to worry about. And the longer that blister is open, um, the more susceptible it is to infection. So being able to handle that is something that you want to do. So what I carry for that is just some moleskin. Then I've got moleskin plus some padding and then kind of mole foam with padding. And these are basically three different thicknesses of the same thing with the goal of covering that blister and, produce, and reducing friction and things that are making it worse. A uh, couple of little vials of tincture of benzoin, uh, which these come with steri strips. So that's another thing we can talk about when we get into wound closures. But this just is a kind of a, an antiseptic and it's also a super adhesive uh, that makes this stick a lot better for your blisters. So that's what I carry in my blister kit. So those are kind of your five Bs. And again, your bites and stings kit is your car keys, your vehicle, and your cell phone. Those are the best things you can have for the bites and stings. Having said that, I'm not allergic, uh, so I don't carry a bee sting kit or an allergy kit, you know, an EpiPen, epinephrine, uh, as well as uh, some sort of oral antihistamine like uh, Benadryl. If you are allergic, then I recommend that you get with your doctor. Your doctor will prescribe whatever you need for that. If you're susceptible to bee stings, that's something you need to carry in your kit when you're out in the wilderness exposed to that potential allergen. So revisiting that March protocol with the H in March being hypothermia prevention. Uh, granted, it's, it's often a function of your shelter system and your fire kit um, in the normal gear that you're carrying. Uh, but for me, I live in the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, we have winter basically, you know, winter seems to be a little bit longer up where I'm at and it's a lot colder. Uh, and having students having a way to prevent hypothermia in addition to their kit, you know, is, is always a good idea. So I'm going to show you kind of what you need to have in that. And along with hypothermia prevention, going back to massive hemorrhage, you know, the bleed itself is your primary concern. Following that bleed, the lack of volume, hypovolemia leading to hypovolemic shock is what's going to kill you after the bleed. So you need to be able to handle that. And part of handling shock, one of the main priorities of that is to help maintain that core body temperature. So that's where this comes into play. So what I carry is a heat reflective shell from North American Rescue. Uh, this is basically a space blanket that's kind of in a mummy sleeping bag style with a hood on it. Uh, that at a minimum, so I can wrap the patient up in that, wrap the person up in that, or wrap myself up in that if I'm suspecting that I'm going into shock is something that I recommend you carry. Uh, and that can be used in addition with wool blankets, uh, sleeping pads, things that you have in your normal kit. Uh, for me, up in the wintertime, I'll usually add one of these ready heat blankets, which is basically a self-heating blanket or a self-heating blanket insert that you put inside this, which maintains the heat. These heat, uh, provide their own heat for about 10 hours, uh, which should be plenty of time to get a person out of the back country. Uh, so if you need additional heat, if you're in that type of an area, then I recommend you throw one of these ready heat blankets in with your heat reflective shell. And those two things together are what the military called a hypothermia prevention and management kit, the HPMK. So that is a hypothermia kit. And again, that goes along with uh, preventing or treating for shock in the field and also hypothermia prevention.